Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel L. Conan, along with Spencer Israel, and we have Gordon Johnson on the line. He is head of alternative energy, metals and mining and equipment, rental research, managing director, Axiom Capital Management. Gordon, thanks for coming on the show. How are you doing on this Tuesday morning? I'm good, thanks, and thanks for having me. Uh, now, I'm looking at your list of ratings here, and, you know, we, we make fun of Wall Street analysts a lot for, you know, their buy ratings and, you know, being super bullish the market until, you know, things turn around and then they kind of get bearish at the bottom. But, you know, I'm looking at, like, a majority of your ratings here, and... They're they're sell they're sell positions. I think the best thing that you have is a hold here. Um, is that I mean is that just the particular sector that you're covering in? Uh, you know what do, or sectors? You know what do you attribute this to? Yeah. So you know what's interesting is there's a website called Tip Ranks, and if you go on that website right now, we're ranked in the top 25. Um, over the since 2009, our calls um, have returned about 26 percent. And 81% of our calls have been sell rated. But if you look at the other 24 analysts, uh, they're probably 80 to 95 to 99% buys, with the highest percent sell rankings being like, you know, 5%. Keep in mind, we've been in a bull market for some time. So uh, I think it's uh, it's important um, to, to note that while we do have a lot of sell ratings, uh, we're not sell um, or short sellers. We just look for opportunities in the market to exploit and we see opportunities in the sectors we cover solar still iron ore um, the industrial complex as well as as well as rails right now so that's really the impetus for our uh, negative bias I mean so you 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 put the sell ratings and then you wait for it to come back into value or are you just helping your you know your uh, your customers avoid these stocks so they can allocate their resources other places no, we want our customers to short these stocks to make return on the short side. Okay. Uh, we find um, stocks that we either think are going to go significantly lower or significantly higher, um, i.e. what we think are arbitrage opportunities in the market, um, and we recommend those opportunities to our clients. And again, um, you know, a lot of people look at institutional investor to uh, evaluate analysts, but I think it's really a popularity contest. I think the right way to evaluate analysts, sell-side analysts, is, look, is to look at what their calls have done. Um, and, and then, again, a great ray, uh, site to, to do that is tipranks.com. And if you look at that site, again, on average, our sell ratings in this bull market have returned um, over the past nine years an average of 26%. All right, so let's talk about Sun Edison. This thing is in the news all the time. How long have you had, you know, the sell rating on it? You know, tell us what the heck. I mean, I can't even make out from all the headlines what's going on in the company. You recently upgraded it to a hold in a price target of $2. How long have you been on this Sun Edison? I mean, we've been covering Sun Edison for a while now, over a year. We downgraded the stock to hold right below $20 uh, when a lot of people were still very bullish. We were very negative on the stock when we downgraded the hold, but you know, admittedly, we didn't have a sell rating. We downgraded to the sell when the stock, uh, you know, was at roughly five dollars with a two-dollar price target. It went to two and change, and then it went right back to you know five dollars, and now it's down in the low threes. Um, we downgraded the stock to sell in late November of 2015. We upgraded the stock last week to hold, um, representing roughly a 32% return from late November through. Uh, last week, which I would argue is a great return over a short period of time, but we still think they have major issues. Um, you know, the, the, the story for Sun Edison in a nutshell, the simple story is um, it's a company that um, effectively um, was the first to get, or among the first to launch its yield co, uh, Terraform Power. It now has two yield co's, Terraform Power and Terraform Global. Power focused on uh, OECD countries and um, uh, Global focused on more emerging market countries. The point is this, though. Sun Edison amassed a massive amount of debt. From 2011 to 2000, uh, roughly 15, uh, you saw its debt grow from roughly $2 billion to roughly $12 billion. And the majority of that debt was used to buy projects 
um, solar projects um, and pipeline that they intended to drop down into their yield co. Um, and for a long time, the yield co was being valued by the market at a three and a half to four percent dividend yield. And the assumption was that that dividend yield will be existent for you know uh, the foreseeable future. And so Sun Edison was very aggressive in the way they were bidding for projects. Uh, and very aggressive in the amount of debt they were raising because you had a lot of smart guys um, uh, invested in the stock and telling them to do just that, including us. We were long the stock um, uh, from about 20 to, to 32. Um, uh, and essentially what happened is the Yoko story ended, and this was a company left with a lot of debt and a lot of projects, which are extremely capital-intensive. Uh, but more importantly, they had an entity in Terraform Power and Global that was willing to buy all of their projects at very you know, nice gross margins. And when the Yoko story fell apart, you didn't have that buyer of first resort, which meant that your costs were going to go higher to sell each project, and these projects are highly capital intensive. So the question now is, can Sun Edison sell these projects in the third-party merchant market? And they've been aggressively trying to do this since you know, um, the, the, the second quarter of last year, and still to this day, we've seen them essentially unable to sell projects outside of selling to their own warehouses and or forcing projects down to their yield codes. Um, so I think the outcome for Sun Edison is still um, uncertain. But given the number of deals and the type of deals they've done, the most recent of which was raising a you know, two-year paper at 12% oh. interest, um, would suggest that they're in a very distressed state with respect to cash. Um, and if they're unable to sell those projects, um, you know, I, I don't know how much longer the company, uh, uh, effectively, the equity can last. I mean, if you look at where the bonds are trading for Sun Edison, the debt markets are telling you the equity has zero value. And I think the reason why the equity has been such uh, so strong in, 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 in the face of this is because you have a lot of big hedge fund investors that essentially got into the stock in the twenty to thirty dollar level, and they're saying, "Hey, it's at you know three dollars. So if it goes to zero, hey, you know, it's a big deal. Um, net net, the stock is going to go where the stock is going to go. But I think that if you look at what the debt's trading at for Sun Edison, it would it would suggest that the equity should be much lower. Uh, we have a two dollar price target, and we think that's where it's headed. And uh, just uh, you know, looking at this, could you just and you use the term yield co here? Could you just you know define that for our listeners? Yeah, the way to think about a yield co is it's an entity in which you invest. Um, and it, that's a good question. So, a yield co is an entity which you invest that essentially buys assets that generate cash flow. And, 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 and what they do with those cash flows is they pay you effectively a dividend on those cash flows. Um, and, you know, uh, effectively, people got excited about the prospect of Yield Co. But I think one of the big mistakes people made is a Yield Co. is a return on cash, not a return of cash. And what I mean by that is when you invest in a bond, the interest rate you get is great, but then you get your coupon back or effectively your initial investment back at the end of life of the bond. With a yield code, you don't get anything back at the end of life, and I think a lot of investors were of the mindset that you did. So I think a lot of people um, you know, were not fully aware of what they were investing in, and I think that's a lot of the reason why you've had big volatility in some of these yield code stocks. And uh, c- coming in from the chat here, do you think they uh, underestimated, you know, the amount of other solar assets that were going to be hitting the market? Um, I don't think they underestimated the other amount of solar assets. I think what they underestimated was um, their ability to make very aggressive acquisitions at a very high pace and make it all come to fruition. I think the undoing of Sun Edison's story really – um, uh, I guess, peaked when they purchased the Vent Solar. And the way to think about that is they had a massive backlog of projects that were not completed, that they could complete and then drop down to their Yoko, which would require a lot of incremental capital and a lot of incremental work. And instead of, you know, focusing on that, they went out and brought a you know, essentially an asset in Vivint Solar that was backed by, you know, residential um, solar projects, which are much higher risk than the majority of what was in Terraform Power's portfolio. Thus, inevitably, the dividend yield that the incremental investor is going to request would go higher. And this whole story, we always said, we never, we never, 
you know, people, you know, categorize Sun Edison's management as geniuses, and we think they're great. But we, you know, we never said that, you know, we thought that management was significantly better than anyone else. We never stated that we think that solar is going to take over um, as a technology globally. We never stated any of these species that people had, grid parity. We never believed in that. The simple story for Sun Edison was there was an arbitrage in the market. People were willing to value them at a 4% dividend yield, which meant their cost of capital was low. And the return on projects in the third-party market that they could go out and acquire was 9%. So the spread between that 45 to 5% cost of capital versus the 9% return on projects they could return was essentially cash that was just going to accrue to them. It was literally like a magic cash machine. It was an arbitrage that no doubt wasn't going to last forever, but we thought it was going to last for much longer than it did. I, I think they made the mistake of, 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 of thinking that the story was more than simply the arbitrage. Uh, do you think that they bailed themselves out with the recent financing deal? Uh, to one of our chat listeners here, it was very confusing, uh, though it was perceived as very negative. Another part of uh, a bad deal here? Or did they did they actually make a good move in their recent financing? No, absolutely not. I mean, um, they're effectively retiring debt 20 years out for two-year paper at 12%. Um, interest. Um, there's still there's still nine billion dollars to ten billion dollars of debt still outstanding uh, that they're probably going to have to do something with over the near term. I think this deal is ma- it, 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 essentially this deal makes me more cautious than less cautious on the company's ability to make it through 2016. And you know a lot of the, you know a lot of solar stocks rallied. Um, in December, the TAN index, the Guggenheim um, Solar um, uh, Index, was up 24% from peak to trough in just the month of December of 2015 alone. That was driven by headline catalysts that I think have nothing to do with Sun Edison's ability to survive through 2016. If the ITC is extended, which it was, uh, past the, the, the initial deadline of you know, January 1st, 2017, that, that doesn't affect Sun Edison's ability to stay solvent through 2016. So I think that, you know, the issue with Sun Edison is I don't care who you are. You could be the smartest hedge fund out there, the smartest mutual fund out there, the smartest sell-side analyst, or the dumbest of all those. <laughs> Sun Edison does not provide you with enough information to fully analyze um, its projects. Thus, anybody who shows you a model and makes assumptions on Sun Edison is doing just that. They're making a lot of assumptions. So for anybody who's out there with a lot of conviction either way, we would significantly argue that that conviction is based based on assumptions that are not founded in reality. It's founded in basically your biased views, whether you're short or you're long. All right, let's get on to some solars that uh, did get the benefit. I believe uh, the uh, some of the subsidies here for customers. You got the big moves here in First Solar, uh, also a big move in Solar City. I mean, these were just unbelievable daily moves here i see you have price targets you know much lower in these issues uh first let's start with uh first solar here uh target i believe you have a target here in the 20s uh how's this scenario gonna uh, actually a target of 30 uh what what's your take here on first solar's recent rally yeah actually we don't cover first solar and haven't for some time now um but you know so so we don't have a lot of strong views there i think that in general um you know the the positivity around first solar centers on the itc extension um and their traditional focus as a utility solar developer uh and thus people are assuming that um you know the utility projects they focus on uh will be more robust uh further into the future uh but with respect to specific detail given we don't cover the stock we're really not comfortable going into that how about solar city then you made a move yeah, so on. solar city you know we initiated it you know in the mid 40s with a 24 dollar price target the stock went to 25 and then it went right back to 50 um the reason why solar city uh went higher is because when the stock went to 25 um you had elon musk come in and buy shares and people got excited about that and silver lake came in and made some investment people got excited about that most importantly, you had the ITC extended the Paris climate deal um, uh, and um, you know the California net metering decision, all of which are headline positives. You know, we put out a solar outlook for 2016, and we stated that in one Q of 15 and in one Q of 14, the solar index from peak to trough was up roughly 35% and 45% respectively. And in both of those years, that massive pickup in solar stocks was driven by headline catalysts. In both of the years, the catalysts were China upping its solar target 
and um, uh, Yoko Euphoria, people getting excited about the prospect of Yokos. And then what happened is subsequently in both of those years, after the 1-2 the Euphoria, the TAN index probably traded off on average about 35 to 40% in both of those years. I.e., once you had that initial euphoria, when people refocus back on fundamentals, the stocks were decimated. And we think this is the same type of thing. We think you had the euphoria in December, um, and now as people focus back on fundamentals, keep in mind the U.S. market is going to be much weaker than both companies and analysts expected because you had the ITC extended. Meaning, if the ITC was cut in January 1st, January 1st of 2017, you're going to have big demand pooling in 2016. And people put that and factor that into their guidance for this year, uh, and analysts were factoring that into their models. But you also have China, which recently came out and guided installations down 17% year over year in 2016, which is unexpected, clearly, um, if you look at sell-side models. And nobody's even talked about that. China is the biggest world market. And then we think in Japan, you're also going to have weakness. We think that market's going to be down because they're essentially eliminating their investment tax credit in March. Um, so you add all that up, and for Solar City specifically, keep in mind California, which is the poster boy for solar in the U.S. at 61% of installations in 2014. The next biggest state was North Carolina at roughly 6%. So clearly, California is the supporter of solar in the United States. They came out and said net metering isn't fair. Now people took the decision as positive because they said the, the, the changes they made were not that draconian. But the point is the changes were incrementally negative, which means every other state, 30 to 40 states that are looking at um, uh, uh, net metering have to come out and effectively um, adjust policy uh, lower. And you saw Nevada recently do that, right? They effectively retroactively cut the incentives for net metering and adjusted policy lower. In fact, Solar City and Sunrun exited the state. So I think that's a very negative data point for Solar City because you're going to have a bunch of incremental decisions on net metering that are negative. Um, and I think fundamentally, Solar City has major issues this year. So the stock went up a lot on headline, uh, you know, headline news. Um, you had a lot of fast money guys rush in, and we think as we go through this year and the fundamentals deteriorate and, cut, and, and, and states come out incrementally more negative on net metering, we think the stock's going to take a huge hit lower. Right. Uh, we wouldn't be shocked to see it at our price target by year end. All right. We'll keep an eye on that. And before I let you go, you have a sell rating and a $28 price target on Caterpillar. Oh, boy, I don't want to think about Caterpillar going at 28 bucks here. Gordon, just in, in a minute or so, uh, give us your evaluation here of the cat. Cat is head and lower. That's an ugly-looking chart there, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, with Caterpillar, we think the issue is, you know, they have three divisions, energy and transport, um, uh, construction and resources. Uh, resources is mining, energy and transport is effectively the fracking, and construction is um, you know U.S. non-resi. Everybody knows that energy and transport and um, uh, 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 their resources divisions are in trouble. The question is, what happens with construction? Uh, and clearly, given what's happened in the U.S. and given the fall in commodity prices, I think construction in the U.S. clearly is beginning to roll over. But I think just as important, if you look at MLP CapEx, Master Limited Partnership CapEx, right? Caterpillar makes the engines which drive the oil and natural gas through the pipelines that are built. Um, MLP CapEx, we think this year is going to be down 75%. And let me tell you why. Oil, the last time oil prices fell in two consecutive years, the, next, the subsequent year, MLP CapEx fell by roughly 80%, and that was in the early 2000s. In 2014 and 15, oil prices are down more than they were those prior two years where in that third year you had a massive decline in MLP CapEx. And if you look at what the MLP companies are saying um, in their quarterly reports, while the street is guiding MLP CapEx up this year, we think it's going to be down significantly. And we think that equates to about $1 to $1.5 billion in revenue at 35% decremental margins um, in Caterpillar's um, uh, energy and transport division. And we think that's something the street is not modeling in, modeling in, in addition to the weakness we see in uh, the the other sectors that they face. And against all of that backdrop, you have Caterpillar Financial, which we think is going to have to take significant write-downs and is not going to be the smoothing mechanism that it has been historically for Caterpillar. Look, this stock is where it's at. I think it's grossly overvalued at this level because people keep calling a bottom. And we saw the same thing with Joy Global. Look at Joy Global and how their earnings deteriorated 2013 through 2015. But the stock really didn't collapse until 2015 when people realized 
hey, this isn't a bottom. And we think 2016 is the come to reality year for Caterpillar when investors realize this is not a bottom. I, I think there's big downside in that stock. Um, we think it happens this year. We've been on the line with Gordon Johnson. He's head of Alternative Energy, Metals, and Mining, Managing Director at Axiom Capital Management. Gordon, great information there. Really appreciate you coming on. We'll have to speak to you again soon. Thank you.